Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, welcome to this very special Shares Month episode where we're going to bust some jargon. Yes, episode two of Shares Month. Yes, it is indeed. Uh, this is a good episode for anyone who is new to the stock market, anyone who is new to ETF investing, basically any type of investing. We are surprised it's taken us more than three years to do this episode. Yeah, we have not busted much jargon in the past unless it was within an episode, but there's a lot of terms that we just use every day. Uh, you'll hear investors on the podcast use all the time that Actually, sometimes there's a little bit to know behind the surface. So in this episode, we're going to break it down, make it as simple to understand as possible mm. um, because some of this can get a little bit confusing. Mm. And this was actually a great idea suggested by our friends at Equity Mates, who we did the Get Started Investing course with. And they are all about breaking down the jargon. So uh, they've done some great episodes called Pardon the Jargon. Mm. Um, and we've actually got a lesson on these common confusing terms and what they mean in the Get Started Investing course, which is free on Rask Education. There's a link in the show notes. So in this episode, we're going to break down 10 different terms, it can be a little bit confusing when it comes to investing. Yeah, cool. So we're going to talk about things like blue chips, bullish and bearish, what that means, difference between ETFs and shares. Um, just to reiterate that, you can enroll in the Get Started Investing course on Resk Education. It is completely free, thanks to our friends at Equity Mates. Kate, let's start with the first one, shares slash stocks slash equities. Are they all the same thing? Yes, all the same thing. People use different words. Um, more commonly, you'll hear the word shares used in Australia when we're talking about things listed on the ASX. But when it comes to the US, you're going to hear stocks a lot more. So if you're looking at YouTube mm -hmm. or different news articles, if you see stocks are crashing, it's probably a US article. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's shares, it's probably Australian article. Yep. So it doesn't. You can use them interchangeably. Shares are like just like a, a slice of a pizza. Shares, you get a share of something. Stocks are the same thing. Equities is what professional investors tend to refer to them as. So if they say that we're an equity investor, it typically means that they're investing in shares. The reason they do that sounds more fancy, but it also represents equity, just like equity in a home. If you have a mortgage, that's obviously debt. And then whatever's left over in your house value or your home's value, that's equity. So it's the same thing when we talk about stocks or yeah. shares. So it's just partial ownership of something. So you yeah. could have a private company that just has one single shareholder, just one share, and you just own everything. Yeah. Um, or you could have a public company with millions and millions of shares, yeah. and you can own one or you could own a thousand. So you can become a shareholder by owning some shares, which is just part of the company. Yep. And that's shares slash stocks slash equities, all the same thing, um, just use interchangeably. Shares for Australians, stocks for the US. So, Kate, then. The next question is brokerage or the next piece of jargon that we have to bust is brokerage. It's sometimes just called brokerage fees. It's called all different types of things. Some people just call it the cost of trading, um, like the trading fee. What is a brokerage fee? So if I want to buy a share of Disney, mm -hmm. which is a listed company in the US, mm -hmm. they have millions of shares and I can choose to buy one, but I can't buy it directly. So what I need to do is find a broker. So there's lots of companies in Australia that are brokerage houses really. Yep. And so that might be Comsec or Perla or Selfwealth or any of those. Mm -hmm. And so with the broker, you can buy shares in Disney from anybody. Mm -hmm. um, you don't really know who you're buying them from, but to do so, you have to pay a brokerage fee. And so the broker gets a fee for making that transaction happen. So if Owen's in the US, he has some Disney shares. I want to buy some Disney shares. I place a buy order, Owen places a sell order, and the broker matches you up. Yep. But you need to use this brokerage platform in the middle to sort of help match up the sellers and the buyers, and brokerage fees are what you pay for that service. And they're usually uh, anywhere between $5 to $20. Yep. Um, but if you're buying US shares, sometimes it's free. Sometimes it's free, and sometimes it does cost more if you have bigger purchase purchases. The minimum is $500 for most traditional share brokerage here in Australia. And you might pay, say, $10. 
that's taken out automatically when you place a trade. So you don't like have to pay a bill or something like no, that. No separate invoice. It, if you if you place a trade, let's say you want five hundred dollars worth of shares, they will and it's a ten dollar brokerage fee, it will be five hundred and ten dollars that's taken out of your account. So you've got to have five hundred and ten dollars available for that. When you sell there's no minimum necessarily. You've just got to make sure that you know that the $10 is in there. So let's say you have $50 worth of shares and it's going to cost you $10 to sell. Um, You might just decide to hold on to your shares and just see what happens. Mm. Um, And that happens to a lot of people too. So the brokerage fee, automatically taken out. Basically, everyone pays it. There are some free brokers in the United States. Um, The brokerage is like the way to access the stock market. So you're going to pay this pretty much regardless of where you go. Um, but as we've talked about before, it's not the be all and end all. You can you know, use a broker with slightly higher fees, so a couple of dollars here or there. It's probably not going to have a huge difference on your wealth in the long term. But if you want the cheapest one there, you can shop around. Yeah. So it's pretty much a transaction fee. Yep. Transaction fee. Good way to put it. So number three is blue chip. Some people call this blue ribbon. So some people say it's a blue ribbon stock. And I always think of the ice cream because I think there's blue ribbon ice cream. Uh, what does blue chip mean? It sounds like Cookie Monster. Yeah. So if you've seen any articles in the news about blue chip companies in Australia, it's probably been in the same sentence as names like CBA or Woolworth. Telstra or BHP. Yep. And I guess the way to explain is there's large companies that are popular, they're part of the ASX 200, which we'll explain a little bit further into the episode, Mm -hmm. Um, and they've just been around for a long time, usually. So they typically have big brands, like you know them when you walk past them in the street, you're you're familiar with that brand. They 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 typically have profits, they're not like early stage companies, so they're reporting profits, they might be paying dividends, those types of things. Um, They're typically really large. So when we say large, what we mean is that the whole company is worth, say, more than a billion dollars or $10 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but there are many companies that big. Um, So these are some of the things. And the other thing, which might be just a criteria for blue chip, is the company typically has like national recognition. So it'd be like you could go to WA, Tasmania, Darwin, and the CBA logo is still there. So it's like it's all around you. Whereas, say, companies that only have operations in one part of Australia might not be considered blue chip. Even even though they might be big, they might not be, you know, a, a national or global brand. Yeah, they're like household names, if yep. you, you could say that. And they're companies that I know a lot of older investors and retirees like because they often mm-hmm. have quite high dividend yields. And mm-hmm. so they're, they're helping pay that passive income for retirement. And they've just, yeah, they've been around for a long time. Yep. And I mean, we don't really like to say this on the podcast, but they're almost seen as too big to fail. Like yeah. Woolworths is not going to disappear overnight or yeah. um, BHP is not going to evaporate overnight, whereas potentially a really small startup um, company that maybe has a $10 million market cap, yeah. which I'd, we probably should explain market cap in a sec, but yeah. that could, the technology could fail to work or they might not get through mm. clinical trials or they might not discover any gold. And that might not be around tomorrow. Yeah. So it's like if you have a cafe that's starting up around the corner, you know, you've seen this yourself in the street. Sometimes the cafes don't work out. So that would be like the equivalent of a smaller company, but stay Starbucks, right? Starbucks, even though maybe you don't drink Starbucks coffee, you know, it's everywhere. It's around the world. So that's an example of a blue chip and a startup company. Like Mm. the startup would be your local trendy hipster cafe and Starbucks would be a big one. So when we say market cap, what that stands for is market capitalization. And that is simply the value of all shares. So if you took all the shares in the company, what are they worth? That's it. Um, So the bigger the market cap means that it's a bigger company because there are more shares Um, and typically they're priced higher too. Yeah. And how do you work out the market cap? So market cap is calculated as the share price at the time multiplied by however many shares there are. So it's like a slice of a pizza. If a pizza had 10 slices uh, and it was $1 a slice, it's $10. That's the market cap. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and you just include, include all the shares. Yeah, and usually that's um, if you just Google a company stock code. So for Telstra, it would be TLS, and then yep. you Google the exchange, which in Australia it's the ASX. Yep. It'll come up with Google Finance, and it will say market cap, yep. and it will have billions of dollars. Like Telstra's probably in that size, yeah. isn't it, right yeah, now? Yeah, <laughs> definitely, yep. So that's, so that's it. So we've busted an extra piece of jargon there for you. So number four is index, index slash indice. Now, we're going to use some examples of these in just a moment, but... We often hear, Kate, on the news, it might say the ASX 200 index or the S&P 500 index or the indice is down or something like this. What on earth does that mean? Yeah. So the index is what the fund or the ETF or 
apps. The news reporter is tracking. So uh, let's say the ASX 200 index Mm -hmm. um, tracks the top 200 companies by market capitalization in Australia. And there's companies that just create these indexes Mm -hmm. and different firms that are brokerage houses or managed funds can use these to either replicate or track or compare theirs to. So often um, you'll see, so if you Google an ETF and you'll see um, this ETF aims to track the ASX 200 index, it'll probably say who created the index too. Mm -hmm. And so then you can actually look up that index itself and see what's contained in that index. Yeah. So it's basically like a basket of something like this is saying, well, it's not even say the basket, it's just saying like what's going to be inside it. Yeah. Um, And you use two examples there. You use the ASX 200, which is our next piece of jargon. And there's another one, which is popular called the Dow Jones. Uh, The ASX 200 is for Australian shares. There are 200 of the biggest shares. The Dow Jones is in the United States. So if someone says the Dow Jones fell 1%, that's basically saying the United States stock market fell 1% today. Mm. And if the ASX went up 2%, we say the ASX or the Australian share market went up 2%. And it's important to remember that if we look at the ASX 200, there are 200 shares in there, right? So it's going to be, you know, spread out across all 200. And if with the Dow Jones, there are 30. So there's not as many. So that can bounce up and down a little bit more because one share can have more of an influence because there's only 30 of them. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Um, There are others around the world. There are many. Basically, thanks to ETFs, every time an ETF comes out, they want an index to track. So then the index provider is like, oh, we'll create one. We'll create one for renewable energy stocks and we'll find all these renewable energy stocks and we'll put them in this index and then you can track that. Yeah, so you've got those common popular indexes that the news reporters are referring to, but then all of these thematic ETFs, which are maybe tracking cybersecurity companies or food companies, they will just create a customized index. And so there's many ETFs around the world where they they have an index that no one else is using. It's just a unique index created just for them. But whereas the ASX 200 index, many ETFs and fund managers will also be using that to track their performance. And it's a good way to, um, you'll see people maybe compare I outperformed the index this year or my fund outperformed the mm. index this year. And the big question is to ask which index you yep. outperformed yep. Um, because they might be outperforming a bond index. And so that's not really apples yep. and apples. Um, so people will often tell you how well they've done um, or the, how poorly their peers have done compared to a certain index. So ask what index it is, have a look at that index and make sure it's um, – a similar comparison. Yeah. So that's a good that's a good one. So think about it like when we say Australian property prices, it's the same thing. There's actually s- companies out there like I think realestate.com.au does this. I think Domain does this. I think there are many different um, property, you know, data analytics businesses that do this. But they basically say Australian house prices fell 5% in March. And what they're doing is they're getting a heap of houses and they're like sampling them. And they're saying, okay, the average selling price was below what it was this time a year ago or something like that. That's exactly what we do with indexes in um, or indices in, in the share market. We do the same thing. We just get a heap of different companies. We put them in and blah. It doesn't have to be uh, sh- shares. It can also be for bonds. It can be for currencies. It can be You can basically index anything, right? Um, and that's at the end of the day, that's all an index is. Um, and one point I'll double click on, which you mentioned, is that a lot of investors say, I outperform the index. Like the professional investors or your super fund might say, we have an index of this and we did better than it. Um, And that's important. But remember, you're better off looking at these things over three years at least. So if you have a super fund or you have a fund manager or an ETF, look at the performance of that thing against the index over three years. Because from one year to the next, it can change. And you're wanting to be a long-term investor. So... Yeah. Look at it from a long-term perspective. And I've seen some cheeky things in the past where people compare their fund to a cash index and they can yeah. say how much they've outperformed when yeah. it really uh, is not a fair comparison. So sometimes people can be a little bit tricky with indexes. Yeah. yeah, sometimes, like, let's just be real. If you're investing in shares in Australia, the ASX 200 is like the preeminent one. In the United States, you could use the Dow Jones or the S&P 500. In the UK, it would be the FTSE, FTSE 100. So those are the big... Um, indices or indexes that you should be comparing a share investment against. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. So now we've got up to this point where we're talking about this off air, Kate. Number seven is bulls and bears. Yep. So did you want me to explain it or do you want to explain it? I think you had a good explanation. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So 
Kate was trying to get me, for those of you that are watching the video, Kate was trying to get me to do the bull horns, which like kind of like point up. Yeah. And the bear swipes down with its claws when it attacks. Right. So that's how you can think about it. The bull is like, like ramming up and going up and the bear is swiping down. So when we say bullish, we mean it's going up. And when we say bearish, we mean it's going down. Or you think it's going up or, or you think, think it's going you, down. Yeah, you yeah. think. So you might say, I am bearish or I am bullish. It doesn't mean it has gone up or down. It just means what you think is going to happen. Yeah. So you might be bearish on uh, Telstra shares, which means you think it's going to go down. Mm. And I might be bullish, which means I think Telstra is going to go up. Um, that's basically it. But it's used a lot. Like it's used... Uh, by analysts, it's used by brokers. It's used in the news. They have bulls and bears segments. Bulls and bears, yeah. So you might have, they. this is a popular segment on most investing shows is they get the bull and the bear. So someone comes onto the show and they might present an investment and they say, are you bullish or are you bearish? And then they debate it, yep. basically. It's actually a good thing to do if you are investing in something to think about the bull case and the bear case. So what's mm. the good scenario and what's the bad scenario? Yeah. So someone might say they're bullish on the overall market. So they think the overall market's going up. They might be bullish on a particular company. Mm. They think it's going up. They might just be bullish about an idea mm. or a concept or hey, a theme. I'm not going to stop you there. You said bullish on the market. When you say the market, what are you talking about? Oh, I might be talking about the ASX 200. Okay. So I guess you got to drill down there on what they're actually talking about. Yep. I might be bullish that the Global markets going up. Yep. Um, or, or I might. Property market. Yeah. Yep. You could be bullish about the property market. Yep. So people might just use that as a throwaway line to say that they think something is going up over the next however many months or years. Yep. yep. And that's another thing that we talk about timelines. Like if you're bullish, you might be bullish in the short term, which means you're bullish. You think things are going to go up in the short term. How long short term? Well, depends on your definition. But in the long term, you might be bearish. So you might be thinking it's going to go down. So this is how we can kind of get confused, but we can also, as investors, use jargon interchangeably and context matters. Yeah. And even on Rice Media, some of our writers in the past have written, um, taken a particular Australian company and read it, one's written the bull case and one's written the bear case. So yep. the bull case is all the reasons why the company is fantastic and that you should invest in it and it's going up and all the things going well for it. And the bear case would be the opposite of that, of all the things going wrong, why it's not a good company to invest in. And so you really need to look at these two point of views together because otherwise you can get a very one-sided look at a company or an industry. Yeah, for sure you can. So the next one is ETFs versus shares. We talk a lot about both of these things. We're in shares month, but we spend a lot of time doing ETF deep dives and investing in those. What does it mean? Yeah. So as we mentioned before, shares are that piece of ownership in a company, yep. whereas an ETF is a basket of commonly shares, but it could really be a basket of anything. Mm -hmm. So it's going to use an in, track and index. Yep. And so in for, let's like, say, the ASX 200, so the top 200 Australian companies, there are many ETFs that track this index. So instead mm -hmm. of just buying Telstra or just buying BHP, this ETF that's tracking the ASX 200 buys a bit of all of the top 200 largest Australian companies. So you don't actually have to mm. choose, do I want BHP or do I want Fortescue or do I want Telstra? This basket contains a bit of everything. So it's a diversified portfolio of such of Australian companies in, in that ETF. Go. And so um, you don't really have to choose an individual company. And yep. so sometimes people will say to us, well, should you invest in shares or should you invest in ETFs? Mm. Um, and it's not ETFs do a lot of different things. They might have in property investments, they might have bonds, they might have cash. So it's not really one or the other because ETFs do invest in shares. They do both. So yeah. it's really what you want to play a part in your portfolio. You might have ETFs for certain parts of your portfolio and individual shares for other others. You might use ETFs to get exposure to the property market or the mm. bond market or emerging markets overseas. Mm. So it's, it's, I think that basket analogy is really good. I, we've talked, I've used the one in the past, like a HelloFresh box. Yeah. Instead of you know picking what you want for dinner tonight, you just get dinner for a week. It all comes in the box pre-made mm. and you buy the box. You don't buy an individual you know, share. You don't buy an individual I guess, meal for that night, you get everything for the week ready to go. Um, and we've talked a lot about the different types. Like you said, some of those shares have, uh, some of those ETFs has shares inside them. Some of them have bonds. Some of them have currencies. For example, you can invest in an ETF that all it does is it goes and puts money in a US bank account. So you earn US interest rates and you get US dollars. Um, so that's basically it. And so it's like a way to get exposure through the to thing. shares, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's great. Um, we don't, like 
we, we are seeing more and more ETFs come to the market. So we don't have like a view on like which ETF is good or bad. Like we can't just say all ETFs are good or all ETFs are bad. Um, some people try and say that, but it would be totally like false because there are so many different ones. Yeah. And some ETFs are more of a point of view ETF that the market is going to go up or going to go down. Yeah. Um, and some ETFs give you exposure to cryptocurrency now. So um, I think it's quite important to differentiate that ETFs do not equal shares. S yeah. Some ETFs do invest in shares and many of the ETFs that our community are probably investing in do invest in shares, but ETFs do a whole range of different things. So it's important to actually look what is inside the ETF. Yep. It could just be cash. It could just be cash. Yeah. So again, Kate's point before was don't like make sure you compare apples to apples. Yeah. If you are comparing two ETFs, compare two ETFs that do something similar, like one mm. invests in Australian shares, one invests in Australian shares. Yeah, it's it. Try and compare it's those It's important two to read the fine print with ETFs and what they're investing in just because there is so much choice nowadays because they are more popular. Mm -hmm. Kate, I, like, let's be honest. Sometimes we sit down and record these podcasts and we don't know exactly when they're going to go to air. But I can almost guarantee that at this very moment that our dear listener is listening to this podcast or watching it, they're thinking the market might crash. And they're thinking, I heard someone say the market is going to crash. When people say this on TV, on radio, newspaper, on podcast, wherever, they say the market is going to crash. What do they mean by crash? Yeah. So in their mind, the market's going to fall by quite a significant value. Is it about 30%? It depends. See, this is the thing. Yeah. I would say it's 20%. <laughs> right. 20% fall. That would be a crash. Yeah. But some people would say 30%. Yeah. So essentially the value of your portfolio or a particular market, depending on how you're thinking about it in your head, uh, is going to fall by a significant amount. And it's going to happen very suddenly and you're not going to be prepared. And I can probably guarantee you that any given day over the last decades, mm there would be an article saying the market's going to crash next month or next yep. year or in the next few days. Yep. You, you can always find an article or a YouTube video or podcast saying that this is going to happen. And you can find the opposite as well. There's very bullish and very bearish point of views. Mm -hmm. It's funny when um, people lay articles side by side from somewhere like CNBC or Business Insider and literally within the same week, they can talk about how amazing the market is and that it's going up and it's mm. it's in its glory days. And also the market's going to crash in another article by a different journalist. And sometimes people actually point this out and take screenshots of all the articles that have come out in the same week saying completely opposite point of views. So there's a few different things in there. One is that those journalists may have their own opinion so that's just their opinion. Or they might have different time horizons. And so Different we data points. Yeah, different yeah. data points. We might be saying the market's going to crash in the next three months, but then over the next 10 years, it'll be fine. We might say in the next three months, it's going to be fine, but in the next six months, it's not going to be fine. So you can say like in time, things might crash. Um, what I've learned over the years is that the market will crash. No one can predict when they will crash, like mm. specifically or by how much. Because it has to do with psychology, it has to do with like herd behavior as mm. investors, panic, fear, greed, all these things. Uh, and the reason that we have a stock market is because people have different views. If we didn't have different views, you know, we'd have one price for everything and that would be the true price, but that's just simply not the case. Yeah. And so sometimes when people are talking about market crashes in the last few decades, they might be referring to the one that happened during co the start of COVID when there's a lot of uncertainty in March 2020. They might mm -hmm. be talking about the global financial crisis in 07, 08. They might be talking about the tech crash in 2000. So most of us have no a friend or a family member that was affected during one of these. And so that often um, sticks in our memory. Like I know I had an uncle who lost a lot of money in the tech crash of 2000. Yep. And so um, that will shape our views of investing as well. And just keep in mind that most of the time, these are the things that people remember. Yeah. It's not the days where it goes up 1% or up 0.2%. It's the days where there's a big crash. Yeah. And that's scarred in their memory because typically what happens is we might have five years of 5 or 10% gains consistent. Like it might not be straight up or straight down, but it might be just like consistently over time. And people don't notice that. It's, it's the they, slow, steady, boring part of investing. Yeah. And they just expect that. But then as soon as it crashes, it's like, oh my Lord, what is happening here? And that's the thing that they remember because it's more visceral. It's scary. And typically what happens in those moments is people panic and sell. And so they do in fact lose money. But what we've seen is that over the long term, you can just ride out the bumps. Most, you know, most of the time over any stretch from like 10 years or more, it just pays just to ride out the bumps. It's yeah. painful, but it works. So there are some statistics that I've read over time. And we've had Nick Majuli on the show before who talked about this. Um, so like only, you know, the stock market on average corrects, that's a 10% fall once every 
roughly a year. So on average, it will fall 10%. Um, but only one in five of those turn into a proper crash. So if you think about that, you can just either try and panic all the time and predict when they're going to happen, or you can just accept it and move on. Um, there will be scary times. There will be good times. There'll be good times that seem scary and bad times that seem good yeah. because of prices have fallen. But, but it's um, a lot easier to deal with uh, events like market crashes if you understand what you're investing mm-hmm. in. You've done your homework For sure. and you're investing with a long-term horizon. You're not trying to make a short-term bet on yeah. a different a particular theme or a share or an asset class. I find that a lot of people go wrong because they don't understand what they're invested in. If you just look at the long-term performance, you got to remember the stock market is here after hundreds of years of being in existence. And in that time, we've had wars, famines, recessions, depressions. Um, we've had like nuclear disasters. We've had Cold War. We've had invasions. You name it, we've had it. And the stock market is still around. Yeah. Um, so that should give you some comfort. And I believe the reason that that happens and the reason that we kind of bounce back is that human innovation is constantly, you know, building And the stock market is where companies that innovate are found. So if you want to own some of that, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Be in the stock market. And you might understand what you're investing in, but you also might have the wrong time frame or the wrong goals because your goals of buying a house in three years might not match up with what you've invested in. So that's that's also another thing. um, Knowing what you're investing in, making sure uh, that aligns with your goals and what you're when you're actually planning to need that money, is it for retirement in 30, 40 years, or is it for something in the next couple of years? Um, That's really important to know as well. And whether you've got even in past episodes, have you got your emergency fund in it? Are you good for short-term emergencies? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Notice how I said 10 years when I said the market tends to be positive. Yeah. And you said in the short term, that's zero to three years typically. So the stock market is a long-term wealth creation vehicle. In the short term, it's like, it seems random. Like even anyone could tell you that. Um, Kate, the last one is where we start, we, we're going to use a, a, a slash. We're going to say P slash E or PE ratio. This is something, this is a piece of jargon that is thrown around everywhere by share investors. What does it mean? And then maybe we can just riff on whether it's important or not. I don't know why you should be asking me what this means because I realized last week I didn't really understand what it meant because I was wondering why a company Mm. could have a negative, a a zero PE. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So PE, so there's the P slash E, PER, all caps, or just PE ratio stands for price earnings. Now, what it means is it means we're comparing the share price to the earnings, which is another word for profit. So we're basically comparing the price of the shares to how much profit it makes. A way to think about this in another sense is that, remember the market cap, which we Mm. talked about, which is the value of all of the company. Imagine you've got all of the company and you compare that to the yearly profit. You divide the value of the company by the profit and that's the PE ratio, the price of the company to the earnings or profit of the company. So a good example, let's say you have a cafe and the cafe is worth $100,000 and it has profits or earnings of $10,000. That's a PE ratio of 10 because it's 100,000 divided by 10,000, which equals 10. Now, the, some people say that a low PE stock, so a stock or a share of a company that has you know, a PE ratio of 10 or below might be cheap. And one that has a PE ratio of 20 or more might be expensive. However, it's important to understand that when we use these ratios, these shorthand heuristics in investing, they don't always work. So what the takeaway should be if you're learning about the PE ratio is don't stop there. Look at other things as well. When I started my investing, it was find low PE stocks because that's what it says in the textbooks. But then everyone does that and it doesn't work. Mm. So there are a few things here. Um, you said, oh, how can it have like a no PE ratio? That's because it doesn't have profits. So, mm. you know, maths, we can't divide by nothing. So um, the other thing is we can have, we can actually have negative PE ratios because if a company has negative earnings, you could divide it. Yeah, It would just be a negative number. Because when you Google a company, like we mentioned before with TLS, ASX, and it comes up with the market cap and other details, it also comes up with the PE. And sometimes yeah. it just has nothing there. Yeah, sometimes it's just blank. Um, that's in Google. Yeah, that, that's pretty common actually. Um, and this this comes back to a few different things. If you were to look in Google for the P ratio of Telstra, I don't know what it is right now, but then you were to go to Yahoo Finance and look at it. And then you go to 
the Morningstar website, just using some examples, all three of them could have a different PE ratio for the same company. You're like, well, how does that work? It only has, there's only one stock price and they all have the same profit. Well, you could have a PE ratio calculated using last year's profits. It could be calculated using what analysts expect in the future, or it could be a blended rate. Um, but also, this is what is really important to understand is some companies, like for example, Zero, which is an accounting software company in Australia we've talked about on the show recently. Um, and as of May 2022, Zero, it doesn't look like it has a P ratio, but it did look like it had one last year, a very big one. And that's because the company is only earning a small amount of profit, but in the future, it could earn a lot more. So it looks like the number's very big right now because we're dividing by a very, very small amount of profit. So the, the key takeaway for the PE ratio calculates the value of the company against the profits for that year. Um, low does not always mean good, um, contrary to what you might have heard. And um, make sure there's more tools in your toolkit because it, this is only one of hundreds of different ratios that we can use. Kate, that's the PE ratio we've been through. Let's just recap what we've gone through. We've gone through about 10 different things. We threw a few more in. We've got shares. They're the same things as stocks slash equities. A brokerage fee is taken out automatically when you buy or trade shares. Blue chip is not blue ribbon. It's blue chips, uh, like a cookie. It is um, a bigger, more established companies. We've got an index. is just like, what are we tracking? Mm -hmm. um, we've got Dow Jones, which is the US stock market index. We've got the ASX 200, which is the Aussie one for shares. Bull versus bear. Remember the horns of a bull go up, the bear swipes down. ETF versus shares. ETF is just a basket. A share is like an individual ownership of like one share. Market crash, we could say it's 20 or 30%. It really depends. Mm -hmm. And finally, the PE ratio is like a valuation ratio that compares the value of a company to its profits. It's a lot to go through in one yes. podcast, but we did it. Yes. And it's broken down a bit more. There's a bit more information on each one in our Get Started Investing course with Equity Mates, which is mm. free as well. And there's a video with Owen and the guys from Equity Mates also breaking down some of these terms, which might help as well. Yep. Great. So you can enroll in that for free on Rask Education. We'll be back with more share investing episodes soon. So be sure to listen to the Australian Finance Podcast over the coming weeks and months. Yeah, and you'll get to see some of these terms used in practice over yes, the next few will. weeks. So Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone.